Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. If you were playing video games in the early 90s, then you will be able to instantly recall just how popular and beloved that Street Fighter 2 along with its reiterations were. After the game rejuvenated the arcade industry and had become a big hit at home, 1993 would lead to another exciting event unfolding, the release of Super Street Fighter 2 and the inclusion of the four new challenges. While we have already looked at the history of the likes of Kami, V Long and DJ, one of these characters' stories is yet to be told, and that is of course the Tao of the towering Native American fighter known as T-Hawk. Not only today are we going to look at the emergence of this character and all of his subsequent video game and media appearances, but I have had help producing this video from some very important people who actually worked on Super Street Fighter 2 back in the day. This means that I will be able to bring to you behind the scenes information regarding the creation of this warrior, which has never been unveiled until now. So sit back and relax and enjoy this rather special episode. This ladies and gentlemen is the captivating story of T-Hawk, the fighter who had his land stolen. Yeah. There are many key figures who have worked on the Street Fighter franchise over the years, who have helped shape the brand that we all know and love now. One of these key figures is of course James Goddard, a man who would get to play Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior at Sunnyvale Golfland way back in January of 1991. The Street Fighter 2 lover would end up landing a job at Capcom within months of experience in the game ending up becoming an apprentice designer for the game's first arcade reiteration known as Champion Edition, which he would co-balance. Past this point he would become a co-lead for the development of Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, a game with increased play speed that he had pitched to be created himself. But a chapter of his career that is rarely talked about is his involvement in the creation of Super Street Fighter 2, the game that would include the four new challenges. James has kindly offered to help with today's video, so without further ado, over to him. Yeah. Okay, Big Daddy Top Hat. Here is a story from way back in 1993. Besides being a game designer and training under my Japanese mentors, I had also built and managed Capcom USA's R&D support team, which handled location testing, feedback, and localization. This team included Dave Winstead, Alex Jimenez, Joe Gaines and myself, all working from the Capcom USA Sunnyvale office. Over time, this grew into helping also with brainstorming story adjustments and character names that would just work better in both Japan and Western markets. We also did some very early work in cultural awareness to make sure characters were better represented in games like Slam Masters and Super Street Fighter 2. Our support team has a lot of cool stories about working with Capcom Japan, for example, recently you may have heard the story about when I created DJ. But a story that has never been fully told is what happened when we first saw T-Hawk's original concept while on location test at Capcom's Yellow Brick Road in La Jolla, California. The team from Japan had brought Polaroids of the four new Super Street Fighter 2 characters for me to review and for my team to provide feedback on. I asked Japan for permission to pull in our friend and Yellow Brick Road employee Steve Patton who had Native American family, so we could give better feedback on T-Hawk. Steve was able to help us quickly provide feedback talking with the team on site, and it eventually led to a version that was more culturally appropriate. Steve has gone long uncredited for this work. Let me introduce you to Steve Patton. Steve Patton was a gentleman who was key in shaping the image of the T-Hawk, who we all know and love today. Without his input on the project, we would likely have gotten a very different looking character. James was kind enough to relay my questions to this undersung hero, so that we could all learn more about this new challenger's origins than ever before. Steve reveals to us that in the early days, the original concepts he was shown from Capcom would display a character with an Elvis hairdo sporting a full Native American headdress the sort of which is worn by tribal leaders. Steve would look at this and instead propose that the character should wear a headband adorned with two feathers due to, in his own words and opinion, 
The Native American Indian appearance, as it was portrayed in so many times previously in media, made frequent use of the headdress, also known as a war bonnet. To me, that diminished its real-world significance in Native American culture. That, and it was just too played out. So I felt his appearance needed something new. As for the Elvis hairdo, it just didn't look right and didn't fit in with his overall appearance. Patton went on to mention that when it comes to Street Fighter characters and T-Hawk's design, it was somewhat of a balancing act as he had to fit in with the Street Fighter lore and art style alongside a roster of other over-the-top looking characters, so there was only so much he could do. Steve states, They had to be more than just characters, they had to have character visually. So my aim was to, at the very least, try to avoid making him racially offensive as best I could. In regards to T-Hawk's name, Patton states that In a discussion with a member of Japan's R&D team during a local test in San Diego, the first name I proposed was Thunderbird, but the name didn't translate well into Japanese according to them. So working forward from there, it evolved into Thunderhawk, which they liked. But I also proposed that if a more traditional naming convention was preferable, we could alternatively use Thomas Hawk. So that was the name we settled on, but it was then abbreviated as T-Hawk in the end. After much refinement to get the character as close to perfect as possible, T-Hawk would eventually debut in Super Street Fighter 2. T-Hawk would stand out from a pack as an immensely tall and muscular man. His iconic look features paint on his cheeks and lower jaw, with him wearing clothing consisting of a denim vest and jeans with eye braces entirely covering both forearms. He also wears thin steel armbands around his biceps, a cowboy s brown leathery belt with a huge buckle and metal decorative tokens, moccasin boots and a blue and white triangular patterned headband ostentating a pair of eagle feathers, the very feathers that were suggested by our friend Steve Patton. Like other combatants in the game, he would enter the second World Warrior Tournament with a goal of defeating M. Bison. M. Bison and his Shadaloo Syndicate have stolen T-Hawk's people's land. So he vows to defeat the tyrant, reclaim his land and liberate it from tyranny. Now living in Mexico near the Monte Alban Plains, T-Hawk wants nothing more than revenge against the dictator. T-Hawk is an imposing fighter who at the point of his debut was the tallest fighter to appear in Street Fighter as of yet. It is said that this mammoth of a man is equal in strength to even Zangief, but has a lot more finesse in combat. Amongst his arsenal of moves, he has some devastating maneuvers from the likes of a tomahawk buster, condor dive and patented Mexican typhoon techniques. What further sets T-Hawk apart from the competition with others in combat is that despite his size, T-Hawk is not a grappler, but instead often relies on huge swooping aerial attacks in order to crush his opponents. If a gamer is able to play through Super Street Fighter 2 as T-Hawk and overcomes M. Bison, a scene is shown whereby the native holds the dictator by the throat, demanding to know why he drove his people from their land. This sees Bison defiantly telling the native it's because he takes whatever he wants and no one can stop him. Despite M. Bison's words, the game's ending does indeed show that T-Hawk gets his land back. However, it is now desolate and empty. In spite of this, T-Hawk is determined and vows to make his land as great as it once was and bring the Thunderfoot people back to their home. Just one short year after his debut in Super Street Fighter 2, the new challenger would make it to the big screen as a character within the big budget Street Fighter live action movie. In this film that would retcon all previous Street Fighter material, T-Hawk's story and image would be completely different to the one that had been created with the help of Capcom USA's research and development support team. Played by Greg Rainwater, the man portraying the character looks way too small and scrawny to look anything like the beloved new challenger, and serves as nothing more than a military man under the leadership of Guile, leading to his inclusion in the movie being rather lacklustre. To further illustrate how little he was valued with regards to the film, T-Hawk would be left out of the video games that were based on this flick as well. In Japan, in that same year, an animated movie would be produced, with this version of the character looking much more faithful to his portrayal in the video game. In this one, he finds and challenges Ken, 
putting up a great fight against one of the story's main protagonists. In the American animated show that loosely follows the canon of a live action movie, T Hawk would once again appear with a likeness in line with the games and would make multiple appearances throughout the series' run. T Hawk's next video game appearance would occur when he surfaced in the home versions of Street Fighter Alpha 3, a game that follows a chapter of his life prior to his entry into the World Warrior Tournament in Super Street Fighter 2. Alpha 3 is set shortly after members of the Thunderfoot tribe have begun disappearing, with T-Hawk believing that Shadaloo are the ones who are responsible. He soon learns that they are indeed the ones who forced his tribe to relocate, and even murdered his father. So T-Hawk begins trawling the planet looking for the organization's leader, M. Bison. After mowing down most of the game's opponents and making it near the end, T-Hawk encounters one of Bison's bodyguards, Shadaloo Dull, Julie who he quickly identifies as a woman from his village known as Julia, who after interacting with becomes clear has been brainwashed. In the final battle with M. Bison, Bison reveals that he stole the land in order to make T-Hawk and his people hate him, as hatred is the source of M. Bison's psycho powers. T-Hawk manages to defeat the dictator with him escaping, but is fortunately able to save Julia, but sadly not from the brainwashing. His final moment of the game sees him stating he foresees himself fighting M. Bison again, an obvious nod to their encounter in Super Street Fighter 2. Gamers would not get to learn anything further about what would become of T-Hawk until the release of Super Street Fighter 4 in 2010, a game that canonically takes place after the World Warrior Tournament in the Street Fighter 2 games. In T-Hawk Super Street Fighter 4 story cutscenes, it illustrates that T-Hawk's land has begun to recover, but is still not close to its former glory. Further to this, T-Hawk doesn't feel he is worthy of becoming the next Thunderfoot tribe chief, due to ultimately not being able to save Julia. To attempt to atone, T-Hawk enters the Sin Tournament, which sees him face off against new and familiar foe alike. If T-Hawk overcomes Seth at the end of the game, he then meets Rose, who is able to tell him where Julia is, but has to warn him that she has become a shell of her former self. T-Hawk finds Julia in the care of an elderly couple, but she is in an awful mental state. She is not even able to recognise T-Hawk or even his presence. Sadly, up until now, this would be T-Hawk's last appearance in the Street Fighter 4 story with it being questionable whether this ending was canon to begin with, as Julia re-emerges as a Shadaloo doll in Street Fighter V, with the events between the two games being unclear. While T-Hawk has made less appearances over the years than many members of Street Fighter's lineup, there is no doubt that with his inclusion as one of the new challengers at Street Fighter II's height of popularity, that T-Hawk is indeed an iconic fighter. Bearing all of this in mind, I capitalised on the opportunity to ask Steve Patton himself his opinions on the character's future, and if he thinks T-Hawk has aged well. Patton stated, I guess it depends on who you ask. Street Fighter purists would probably say yes. On the other hand, though, those who are maybe a bit more progressive might disagree and feel that he should change with the times, look more true to life and less the historical stereotype. But if you change who he is, then you lose the essence of the character that players liked in the first place. So for me anyway, I do prefer that he stay as true to his original design as possible. Learning today that T-Hawk was designed to look less stereotypical than Native American characters who appeared in most Japanese made video games back in the day, I also asked him if he felt representation had gotten better, with him stating, it's been a slow uphill road, but yes. Sadly, that was not always the case though, especially going back into the earliest days of video games like Oregon Trail. However, I think it was around 2000 or so when some game developers finally started to take more positive steps as to how they represented Native Americans in their games. A personal favorite being the original Prey, which came out in 2006, a game still in my collection to this day. They not only centered the story on a well-written character, Tommy Tabodi, but the voice actor, Michael Greyeyes, was also Native American and had a fair bit of creative input on the game's development as well. As we move further into the future of gaming, we now find ourselves getting closer to the release of Street Fighter VI, the next mainline entry from the famous franchise. 
So this got me thinking, what Steve would propose for the character if he had a consultation role working on that game. Mr. Patton stated that, Given how much time has passed since he was created, maybe now they could finally give him an alternate skin to include the full headdress. I think he's waited long enough. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the captivating story of T-Hawk. Just like all characters from the Street Fighter universe, there is far more to this character's history and backstory than what may perhaps meet the eye. With way more thought, love and attention going into his design than many other video game characters from that era of entertainment. Steve Patton, James Goddard and his team were taking steps forward to consider more appropriate representation in video games way before most corporate companies even had framework for such things in place. Proof of this can be found through the thoughtful design process that went into the creation of the new challenges. Before I conclude this video, I would like to give a huge thank you to Steve Patton for bringing his unique memories to the table and of course to James Goddard for not only hooking me up with Steve, but lavishing us with additional info and providing his dulcet tones for this episode. These lads are not just Street Fighter legends, but legends in general. So thank you fellas. Obviously it probably goes without saying by this point, but I would also like to give a massive thank you to everyone who has watched this video today. And if you are new here, there are plenty more character retrospectives like this one that you can check out if you'd like to. Videos like this covering the lesser told chapters of gaming history are partially possible due to the additional support I receive via Patreon. This means I can focus on creating the most interesting videos possible instead of solely chasing views. Speaking of my backers, special shout outs go out to A Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heyo Paula Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Haradine, Corey I. Marsh Sr., Ryan Dinched, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Azurakai, Dropkin Varela, Michael Calix, Ego, Jordan Durant, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Johnny Holly, August Piazza, Justin Wang, Capcom vs SNK, Hermes Gonzalez, Man Shovel, Michael Hall, Sanghi, Norma Stitz, Langston Miller, Noob, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Rene, Marvin Oliga, Teo Dree Driver, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Synth Spaces, Punk Toast, and everybody else who backs what I do on the Patreon platform. Thank you very much. Cheerio.